Linux OTC. Welcome to episode 37. I'm Bill. I'm Eric. And I'm Leo. Yeah. So, Leo, I was checking out uh, the latest episode. What was it? Season 5 episode... What was it? Two. Episode, episode two. two. Your your most recent episode of Linux User Space. Go check it out. LinuxUserspace.show. Mm-hmm. Uh, all about Mint. Well, I think you you meant it to be more about cinnamon, but it, then it it seemed like it kind of became a lot about mint. It was a good history lesson on mint itself. Yeah, I didn't realize you you can't you can't separate the two. They're one and the same, really. Um, cinnamon was driven to or uh, Linux Mint was driven to create cinnamon because of the whole GNOME three thing, right? So once GNOME three came out, uh, mint was essentially creating a bunch of plugins for GNOME 3 to make it like GNOME 2. So, uh, and, th- and that wasn't really sustainable. So they ended up just creating Cinnamon, which was, at least in their eyes, the best of GNOME 3, and so that they could create essentially a Windows XP, Windows 7 kind of situation. So it kind of eased the transition in for people uh, when they're moving over to Linux. It, it feels familiar. I got to say, I agree with him, because at the time, I remember being, well, I was blindsided by the, uh, what was it, 1604 when they, or not 16, 1710 when Ubuntu switched over to, back to, uh, I was blindsided by that, I was blindsided when they switched to Unity, and then here comes Mint, I go back to Mint, and Mint's got a nice new thing that looks... The way normal, uh, normal. The way we uh, <laughs> have become accustomed to using our computers, and so. But I liked Unity, man. I was one of the ones that was sad when I, they decided they were going to go back to GNOME. I, I, man, the Amazon thing didn't even really bother me that much. I didn't like it. No, nah, that didn't. Wrong. That was a non-issue. Period. But man, I miss, I miss Unity. I know you can still get it, but it's not the official flavor, so it doesn't have gobs and gobs of money going behind it, you know what I mean? It's not going to get so. iterated upon much anymore. It's, it's kind of is what it was at the end there. And, yeah. and you notice it. it, too. If you use it now, it does feel sort of outmoded at this point. Yeah. So, I mean, all the good ideas are still there, the way the window management and sort of the launcher and you know, all those secret sauce kind of things are still there, but there are definitely some kind of aspects to it that just feel dated at this point. Yeah. yeah. It, it's unfortunate. Because I, I, I guess, if I were being honest, I really appreciated the way Unity worked, too. Once you get past the buttons being on the left, which, you know, once you get past it, then it's like, ah. They're always on the left on the best operating systems, yeah. right? Oh, like God, the Apple go. icon, you click, you <laughs> click, it's up in the left. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. And he's pointing at the machine he's using right now, by the no. way. Wait, no. <laughs> no. Um, but yeah, once you got used to that, especially like on a small real estate screen where you only have one screen, and the way the way Gnome was doing it at the time, the way they're still doing it, you know, if you've got a window open, you've got your title bar up there, and you got title bar, you got your, uh, what do they call it, the, the main bar for the desktop and the title bar for the window. That's a lot of screen real estate when you're using 1366 by 768, you know. Well, so, that's that's your first problem. Well, yeah, but I mean, there there's a significant, especially in those days, there was a significant number of machines out there that were using that that, right. uh, that resolution. And so Unity comes along and says, well, why can't we just combine all that into one thing? And and uh, that really kind of helped out with the screen real estate. I even like the heads-up display thing that it, was, that it was doing and all that. But anyway, Cinnamon comes along and says, okay, Gnome, yeah, that's, that's just them trying to be like Windows 8 or something. <laughs> I, that's the way it felt, right? Because that's about well, the, cause, yeah. the time Windows 8 came out. GNOME makes this huge shift that almost nobody liked. Well, nobody controversial did. opinion here. I thought Windows 8 was fine too. I, I, I thought it was. I, I thought it was slightly better for the masses in 8.1 when they put the button back, the start button down there. But dude, it was it was totally fine because what I think needed to happen is people needed to understand that they're that the Windows button on your keyboard brought the menu up. 
Yeah. Because that was that was the main at least from from cuz I was doing IT. Like I was I was big into IT at the time. Um that was the big complaint. When uh when we upgraded people to Windows 8, it was, "Well, where did the thing go?" And it's like, "Stop worrying about it." And then people got on with it. Once I showed up, they push this on the keyboard. You just push the button. And they're like, "Some oh. people do." Right. But and you do you have a contingent of people who have a very difficult time Whenever you make a fundamental change like that, they all, it's like changing where your turn signals are or something. They're, just, they're always where you think they're going to be until they're not. And then all of a sudden they're not. Yeah. And it just freaks people out. Yeah. Oh, I, t- I totally get it. But I, I think, man, man, like just. It did gotta, help to think of that full screen the times, thing as, as, the, as the menu. And then, of course, when 8.1 came out, I feel like they. It was too late. It was it was too late for them. It made it a lot more usable. It, it, the thing I noticed that kind of bothered me about it was this kind of duplication in software that came along with it. Because there was two of everything on Windows all of a sudden. You had two video players. You had two uh, two uh, audio players. Two two of everything. One in kind of a tablet format, and the other, you know, the 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 old fashioned. Uh, Windows Media Player and stuff like that, and I think yeah. that might have confused some people too. Yeah, they Samsunged it. <laughs> yeah, I, I. So then GNOME comes along and does this, and then uh, Clem decides to go ahead and make something uh, much better. Arguably, even in those days, I know it had its problems at first. Um, a little quirky, I guess, but uh, over time, it's really, gosh, I can't. Even if I'm using, even if I'm using Arch now, I'm still installing uh, Cinnamon on top of it. Oh man, you're gonna get so uh, a so much better experience here in the next couple of months, man. Yeah, when, that's uh, what I heard. I wonder what that's gonna look like when the, it, there's there's some early screenshots. I I imagine that theme will morph a little bit before it actually hits everybody's repos, but it looks really good, man. But but for as much uh, as people say Clem hated GNOME 3, because that really wasn't the case, um, it looks a lot like GNOME 3. Like, it's, well, GNOME 4, 4D now, I guess, right? Like, it looks like the GNOME 40 lineage now, where it takes a lot of kind of design cues from Edweta. So I don't think it's going to really change people's perception of, like, that a lot. But it, it looks a lot like... Edwaita, honestly. Just but having that default, that's really what's important. And I think yeah. that's, if you aren't using Mint, you know, the Mint Y theme set and the icons and all that, Which if is you fantastic. were to just install it. Yeah. Oh, those are, yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the reasons. If I use Cinnamon on anything but Mint, I go and get, I actually have a, a GitHub gist on how to do, how to set it up that gets actually more traffic than you would believe, honestly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it, it just that is cinnamon to me, the mint theme. But I also can see if there's something that's a, is just as clean and professional, and and cohesive. Right, like that's the big part is that all of it fits together so well. And if that experience is good out of the box on something like Debian, which right now, if you install cinnamon on Debian, it is ugly. Yeah, yeah that's that's what we're trying to fix right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Kind of so got... cinnamon now becomes this the nice default that you can then dress up but you're at least starting from a standpoint of like this is usable as is yeah right right so the thing i noticed about cinnamon on like when i put it on arch and even if i installed because you got to get this the, the mint y theme from the aur you still don't get okay so first off the mint y theme on mint itself i kind of liken it to the way uh, Breeze works on Plasma, where if you've got Breeze set as the default for everything, then you can manipulate that that color scheme. I mean, you can do it with a lot of them. I know that, mm-hmm. but but it's kind of a it's kind of a one size fits all sort of theme that can be manipulated in in any color or uh, in a lot of different ways of looking. And Mint Y has got this thing where you've got like a one click theme sort of setting 
And I've only seen that on Mint because when I was running it on, on Arch and tried to use that, you still had to go through. You could get the same effect, but you couldn't get the one-click just uh, sort of thing where you can set it to Mint Y and then hit one button for either uh, a dark or a light or a mixed. And then you've got the rows of uh, different color schemes at the bottom, which is kind of a cool effect. I I, uh, I wasn't crazy about the colors because uh, mint was always kind of a green thing for a long time. And then when mm -hmm. it switched over to kind of blue, I wasn't, I'm like, eh, you know, that doesn't really work in my brain all that well. You know, now it's starting to look more like Manjaro or something, you know. Uh, but, yeah, well, the, the darker green looked more like Manjaro. Blue is just safe, man. It blue is. is. I, I think I we've been say, trained yeah. over the decades to it be is. okay with blue on the desktop. I think, yeah. But you then have to I be careful. With, green is, can be overpowering. You, re, yeah. you can overdo it very easily. But it, I, and I think that's why Linux Mint went with for the longest time with those muted colors, right? Mm -hmm. Like orange. They called it orange, but that was like a sand man, and yeah. I, I wasn't. Yeah. I hated it. I love orange, but I did not like that orange. Well, I. Well, use it's just the, like how they your, decided to. Sorry, Bill, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I, I use the Yaru orange on yeah. this desktop here. That's bright, oh, yeah. dude. I like that. Yeah. But it's that so. nice sort of peachy orange. I, li I like yeah. that. Yeah. And it's I not overwhelming. Say, like, it's, it's not everywhere. It's like how they made the folders a sort of muted yellowy brown manila kind of color instead of, and, and just with, like you're saying with Yaru, where it's just sort of the edge that's colored mm, yeah. versus the whole folder being this bright garish color. Um how it dare seems like you? Design... How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> it seems like design in general, and of course good design, is usually about understating instead of overstating, and I see more of it happening in Linux on the desktop. I mean, it's there's still plenty of garish, kind of like over-the-top stuff, but for, the defaults seem to be gravitating Garuda. more towards... <laughs> it seems to be gravitating more towards, you know, like a... a, a not muted... Because I guess that is one way you could put it, but just something that's more relaxing and easy to use that you're not constantly, again, with the, the green color, where if you're overdoing it, if the folders are green, the highlights are green, the borders are green, it's just like, okay, <laughs> I get it. It's yeah. green. I, th I think the, the idea is to just be invisible, right? Like, sure, have an accent, but be invisible. And that's, that's one of the big things that I like about Cinnamon uh, in general is that uh, unless you're really customizing it that way, pretty invisible yeah and, and i can and Leo, remember some of the android. some of the earlier themes on mint with the green because yeah you're <laughs> green is kind of hard to get right uh manjaro does a pretty good job at it the early mint themes though with a lot of the green and the steel sort of colors and this the skeuomorphic graphics that was all the rave in those days um it would be a little tough on some monitors, I remember. It, it got a little bit intense, you know. So that, it's interesting that the, the trend these days, the modern trend for graphics or, or for, uh, like, icons or anything like that is more of a flat style and a little bit more subdued. Yeah, and we'll, we'll come back. We'll be back to the, it looks real. Just we'll be back soon. to shadows yeah, and 3D. And, yeah, it's all cyclical. <laughs> we'll be back. Yeah. So yeah, um, cinnamon comes along, and uh, it was it was great. It always has been. It's it's been kind of that great middle ground between plasma and and uh, gnome, I think. But I found it interesting. Uh, you guys touched on apt as a package manager. Yeah, yeah. Being completely different in Mint. The only thing I did know that. You did the not real need... apt. It's yeah. not completely different. It's the real right. apt. Just just to be clear. <laughs> I knew that I knew that you didn't have to enter a password in Mint, but I thought maybe that was just something I still think it probably is just something they're doing with policy kit or whatever to make it easier for people. But I did not know that it's actually you know, how does that work? I know that it's it's just a Python sources script. It sources apt, it sources uh, Debian package and all those other tools as well to make it, sure it is works. always just been a Python script 
uh, that really kind of shortened a lot of the commands. Yeah. And then uh, I I need to go back and actually get some the actual history on it. But then Debian decided uh, I don't know if they it had, was in the works before or what, but they decided that apt is a good truncation of apt get so they ran mm-hmm. with it and then but it took years man it took years for apt to be in feature parity with apt get like some stuff just didn't exist it existed in linux mint because i think clem was very uh focused on making sure that anytime um your system needed to do something or whatever it needed to be done or, or it could be done with apt but yeah it took debian years to actually perfect, and I'm doing air quotes here for those mm-hmm. listening, uh, apt to where you didn't have to go back and be like, oh yeah, what's that one in apt get? Because it doesn't work in apt yet. Um, but yeah, but Linux Mint had the very first apt, and I I think that's that's the one, man. It's it's still really, really good. But yeah, it still does make uh, callbacks to apt get and apt cache and apt whatever apt doesn't support. It's really kind of good. I guess I didn't notice it back in the day because I was just, and I still do on on. Because uh, you enjoyed the easy. Yeah, it I was just, just easy. A graphical package manager, and if I oh if I really need to oh. install a bunch of stuff in batch, I'll just get Synaptic for that. So Ooh. you don't like Synaptic? No, no, no. Well, I was forced to use it early days, man, and I didn't like it then. I don't. I like it even less now. No. <laughs> a couple of things I like that. that the way that it handles dependencies and shows you like all these weird icons and I yeah I, I have never liked Synaptic. Well, it I've I've liked it because if you had like when you're setting up a new system and you know exactly the stuff you want to go and get, it's easy just to create a click list basically on there and then hit one button and it goes through and installs all that stuff. And it's got a it's a quick and easy way to install all of the recommended dependencies or optional dependencies along with a package if you right click on that you've got an option to install the recommended stuff too many clicks just get clone run it (laughs) like eric's got the script man eric's got the script you just get clone and then run the script inside the folder that's that's the answer to your question there you go (laughs) pretty much yeah I get what you're saying about there used to be a KDE variant of it called Muon too, but I noticed it was that even got worse. <laughs> no. It it seemed like it was slightly more simplified, but it, it never really. It was slightly more broken always. Yeah. yeah. Listen, never... DNF Dragora was the one, right? Uh, yeah. Gosh. Nope. <laughs> Sorry, I I just package management on the command line. It's the only even for flat packs and stuff now. I still do everything at the, at the command line. Yeah. I do all my updates at the command line. I just do. I mean, you, it, it, you know what big entity in the in the computing space agrees with you now? Windows. Yeah. Oh. Win yeah. get this and win get that and it just you don't you don't you no longer I can't even make the joke anymore about having to inter, uh what is it? Microsoft Edge is only good to go to get firefox.com and download Firefox. Like you can't even make that joke anymore cuz you could just you can just win get install Firefox and skip the whole browser having to click on anything thing. And I think the icon that pops is a... up and you just double click it and you're good. That's that's the type of thing you start to see bleed over from like WSL, you know, yeah. where people are used to having these command line tools. And I, you know, funny enough, whenever I started with Linux, that's exactly I was actually still in DOS at the time. But the the reason I wanted Linux had nothing to do with a, a GUI. It was to all of these powerful command line tools. And I think Windows users are just savvy enough, and especially if you do stuff with like cloud anything. Oh yeah. Um, DevOps, any of that kind of stuff, you know, if you had to use a GUI for that, like I had a, I have a friend who does, uh, you know, DevOps kind of stuff. And he was telling me that the older people that I guess have that Windows mentality, maybe like Windows Server or whatever, still prefer to do everything by clicking through a GUI. And he's like, it is the slowest possible way to do anything. Yeah. And it's so easy to make a mistake for all the people that say, oh, well, you could type the command wrong. Now you can use autocomplete on the command line and stuff. There are ways to to catch that, but it, you know you've missed one checkbox somewhere. You'll go crazy trying to figure out why it's not working. Yeah, have y'all seen it's um it's like Open SSL. I think uh, they uh, somebody did a mock up of a GUI 
of all of the open SSL options. So creating certificates and having these keys and doing all this stuff, right? And it was multiple, multiple tabs, like at least a dozen tabs. And the window was from the top of your screen to the bottom of your screen. <laughs> and dude, the amount of options on the thing would just make you go cross-eyed. And that was just one of the dozen tabs on the entire thing. Be Although but now that you mention it, it would be kind of cool to have something if you could figure out a way to make it intuitive and usable. Uh, because yeah, the, but the, the that one liner would... command to create a certificate and the key file for Yeah, like X509 just had its own entire massive page and <laughs> no. No, man. Like and then if you had to if you had to do multiple tabs of stuff, you would lose track. Anybody that's trying but to But then if to, you had to... a way of if it kept track of all your certificates and you had a way this thing could run in the tray and keep your certificates updated automatically. Well, you only ever want run it once. Like anytime you need a certificate, that's the only time you ever run it. Give it right? a 10-year expiration date. Oh, or... hey, Google, <laughs> Daddy Google said we were going to be shortening up those timelines. It's going to be like 90, 90 days or something like that. Oh, no certificate God. will live longer. The current batch will expire, but uh, pretty soon we're going to be issuing certificates uh, that are much, much shorter uh, in lifetime than than what we've been doing, for and that's years Google and years and years. doing that. Daddy Google, yeah, yeah. Daddy, Daddy Google. Live. What Daddy Google says happens. This is this is the way that it's going to work. This is this is how the Google monopoly works, man. Everybody well, they else can't force Let's Encrypt or anybody like that to do that. No, because they? Let's Encrypt already does that. But right. I mean, that that's the thing though is that yes, they can. Yes, they can. If Daddy Google says so, Let's Encrypt will do thirty days. I guarantee it. Oh, what are you going to do? Let 80% of the internet just not do oh, your well, thing? Fine. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. I honestly hope just... I live long enough to see Google become, you know, the dominance to just fade away somehow or to just up utterly fail. I, yeah. I know it's a Implode. long shot, but I would love to know, to think that there will be a world, a post-Google world. Oh, mm. but see what will be there that, to take its place you would you would need government intervention man there's there's no way google's going to relinquish or accidentally oopsie out of existence there's just no way it would take a monster monster of a company maybe one named after why? A fruit why why because of a search engine because of the ad net networks i mean what do they do it's the literal internet you just described yeah, just the internet those you... are the two things that make up the internet search <sighs> and ads that's it man everything else is it comes and goes <laughs> i mean that's They're, what drives the, the money the to make is, everything but else that's, work but the reason it is that way is because of the, the monopolistic aspect of it. It, it there are no alternatives because there there there's no room for them yeah, I mean, well, there's they're, no they're... reason why you can't have multiple different search engines and different ways of having, you know, access to these websites and finding different things. And I mean, just because Google does it the way it does it doesn't mean that's the only way it can be done or that it has to be one, you know, monolithic company that does it. Yeah, well, OK, so you're you're not wrong. Actually, this is a this is a pretty interesting topic, right? Because. The reason that Google is massive is because they were the they were the avenue to get to the stuff that you didn't know that you wanted, right? And that that was that was search. And when they kind of not perfected, but when they got good at search, they just started slapping ads everywhere and they started making buku bucks by, you know, sending people and then showing them an ad on the right on the way. Well, the disruptors are people like TikTok and Instagram. Because no longer do you need to go Google search your thing. You just scroll your mind into oblivion now, right? Like that's the internet now. So yeah, I think I think those are going to be the types of companies that are going to be disruptors. But those guys are, if not the same, worse. It's going to be the same story. Like I think the avenue to capturing large amounts of the internet is le not letting people leave your space, right? Like if you can become the ad person by uh, we, we host all the videos and then we'll just slip an ad in between a few of these videos. Um, then I think that's the way to win the, the internet that most people know, right? Like the, there's plenty more internet, but the, all, the internet that people know is, well, I just, I just use Facebook or I just use TikTok or I, I just, I just watch a reel or two or YouTube, right? But you can't just only use those things. You still have to pay your oh, bills. Sure you you still have to go to the government.
government website to do this and that. You still have there that, that you know TikTok is not the internet. Like Google is the internet because I don't disagree with you. I mean the idea that people don't just type in a URL and ha never have, by and large, you know they start a search and that's how they get to things. Uh, even, they, even if they could make a bookmark or, or go back to their history, they don't. They still will just go to a fresh page and start typing the search. Yeah, but that's <clears> that's <throat> why you're you're not going to dethrone Google, and that's why TikTok and all these other companies eh, are the only ones that are even in the in the right realm uh, to be able no. to even chip away at I think what if, Google I think has. If, if the monopolistic intent of these companies or the the ability for them to continuously just buy potential comp competition because that's essentially what they do yeah. you know they're big enough to just buy every everybody <laughs> you know that wasn't even a thing a hundred years ago or you know potentially a little bit longer let's say yeah, the, the, the government would slap the shit out of you yeah like they basically <laughs> said no company should be big enough to buy it's a competitor yeah like that should just never be a thing it shouldn't it's it's like it is against the the nature of business and like in how things should operate because you're essentially telling a company that it can be outside of the normal operating parameters of business like and that's exactly what's happened with a lot of the policies that were enacted in the early 80s and you know all of those controls have just stayed the way they are I mean the idea that uh, you know antitrust basically didn't exist for 40 years and now we're just everybody's looking at Lena Khan like Oh my goodness, like they're actually trying to take on these companies and do something about this. It shouldn't even be a big deal. Like people shouldn't even care about it. It's just the way it should work. And it's yeah. the way it did work for a long time until it was all deregulated. Yeah. So anyway. where where is the room for the improvement then? What there what there can't be. That's the thing. Like you can come up with the best idea in the world, but there's too much pressure from Google to just come in and buy you. And it's it. I mean, no, I well, no actually, that's that's the new that's the new way to become a millionaire. I mean, that's, that's absolutely. There's there's quite a quite a number of companies that have started, come up with a good idea, hit the rubber on the road, and just so that. Microsoft or Google or or Facebook. Oh, or that's no, that's their long term them. business plan. Right, yeah, absolutely, right. is, is to, to get be acquired. Acquired, yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And that's th I think this is why uh, open source took off. Not not because it was the better way of development. I think it was just because, uh, uh, right, like the the bigger companies didn't buy them out because they didn't have to. They just took them in and used them, and then we end up with the open SSL. <laughs> How full circle is this? We come up uh, to the open SSL issue where it was just a guy this was the xkcd that was the that was the impetus for that that particular comic was the open ssl guy was just a guy in like nebraska that was keeping the internet glued together with encryption and the guy could barely eat yep. and then and then google was like oh we'll finally take pity on you we'll cut you a forty thousand dollar check like a forty thousand dollar check are you kidding me this guy keeps the entire internet running and you're gonna hook him up with half a year's salary please what a spit in the face man yeah, that's it but yeah that's that's why these companies can continue on because they can just i don't want to say steal, i know it would be not, almost not a, legally stealing but well i know and i think it would be nearly impossible to enforce but i think if licensing made it such that if you were i mean think about how a lot of products are are, are especially subscription type products or pr productivity products are priced if you're an individual or you know a, let's say a business under a certain size you pay this much right because that's what it makes sense to pay but if you're there should be like a sliding scale where you know honestly if you're using all these underlying technologies and you are not only you know using them in your software but you are definitely you know making revenue from them there should be even the smallest amount the, you know, the tiniest fraction of your revenue should have to go back into those projects. Like you know what I'm saying, if you could be licensed that way, where it's like, oh, it sure, could be you licensed can use it. that way. Well, that's it, what I'm saying. Yeah, it could be, but I mean, we, we love our MIT, we love our GPL, we love our whatever, and none of those require payment. None of them. But that's but it should, kind of, and I think it shouldn't for smaller companies, for individuals, for developers who are trying to learn how to code. Like there, there's sure. a lot of, you know, 
altruistic me means by which you could license it so that the right people don't have to be penalized by that or, or have to pay, or the, pay their share, let's say. But just like I'm saying with all these other types of subscription models where if you're going to be making money off of something, then you have to, you know, give back some of that. So because what you're the expectation is... is that they're going to come back and say, okay, one guy in Nebraska, uh, here's, a, here's a million bug reports because we're now using your system, in, you know, your software in a much wider sense than maybe you ever intended it to be. So, uh, you know, here, fix all these bugs for us for nothing because, you know, you're dedicated to this project because it's your, you know, labor of love. And yeah, if there was some amount, like if a guy like that could make six figures a year doing that, I bet he would, he would be so dedicated to doing it. Like that would be the, his dream job probably, right? Yeah. And for, and so, for $500 million, you can be the licensor of that software and I can retire. Mm. But what, what I'm, mm. what I'm getting at is, uh, you really enjoy the way that Ubuntu and Red Hat license their particular operating system, right? Little guy can get it for free, but right. once you're big enough, then you got to start paying. And exactly. So the, that's who, and, but this is, this is how open source has made money for years and years and years, right? Like if you are actually intending to create a business on top of your open source software, it's how you would do it, right? I mean, they, I think it's the only way to do it. Well, is, that and the services based where it's like, well, we can, you, we have the community edition or we have the, you know, right. you can get the source code and you can compile it. But if you want any kind of like a professional service or professional support. Right. You want to be able to call us? Make money. Yeah, exactly. Right. right. Yeah. And that's a good way to do it. And I don't it. have a problem with that. I think yeah. that's a good way. If your product is aligned with that sort of a, you know, a mentality or, or, or you know, the way that you're delivering the service, then yeah, that makes sense. But that doesn't make sense for every model, you know. Right. Whereas you're saying like a, like a Red Hat or, or something like that, that makes perfect sense. You know, you... As a student, as a small entrepreneur, as a whatever, you know, you, you have a certain number of licenses that you're allowed or, or, you know, machines you're allowed. And then once you grow to a certain point, the expectation is you're growing because you're using the software and your business is, you know, benefiting from it. Then you got to get back. Yeah. I think yeah. that's a pretty, pretty solid way to do it. Obviously worked pretty well for Red Hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know, the, the opposite direction is working pretty well for Mint, man. Uh, to kind of bring it back to what we were talking about before, um, Clem explicitly does not do this. Uh, right. He, he just, it is a very much pay what you want kind of situation. And But they're I, also privileged enough to, to be getting enough donor. you know, they're making 50 grand a month, which you can't say that for most... No, no, no. Open source uh, projects. Uh, just getting at that you can do it the full-on altruistic way of you don't ever have oh, to talk to me unless want. you I want. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think there are enough people out there that um, that see that there's value in something like that and then do give back. Um, but those are people. Those are small companies, right? This is You're not never going to see big business do that no. because that's not how they talk. Oh, absolutely They need not. something they can put on an itemized ledger and have yeah. accounts receivable and, and all of this stuff going on. You know, they're never going to go with it. If, well, once, you know, you're, once you're big enough to have a CFO, then, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're not going to be paying these companies. You're not going to yeah. be paying uh, groups like Linux Mint. You're just not. But it is still cool that Linux Mint can exist in this right per, if not altruistic world then perhaps like a i don't know uh, well, value for things. value wor yeah, world you exactly know. and that's the thing like even with like i'm saying with the licenses where it would be easy enough to probably skirt around it and i mean kind of impossible to make sure that you're collecting every dime if it at least set a precedent that the expectation was there that especially something like a cloud company or some someone that's like literally their entire business is open source with maybe like this thin layer of a control panel over top of it. Think of like a web hosting company or like, you know, any of this sort of cloud based stuff where it's everything they use is open source software that has been deployed in, of course, their own particular fashion. And again, they have this sort of layer above it that may be just this sort of you know, control aspect, like configuration, monitoring, that sort of stuff. But the, the guts of everything, right? The entire foundation is stuff that they'd never, 
I mean, maybe they're they're upstreaming some changes that they make if there are any, but by and large, like you're saying, the SSL guy. I mean, that's if that was a one-off and it was just a meme or a joke, like uh huh, you know. But that is true for probably more than we'd want to admit in terms yeah. of the stack that's being used. Well, right? Redis got the whole uh, got a whole news month. Right when they were talking about wanting to change their licensing because uh, AWS had, I mean, br not broken the letter of the license, but the spirit of the license, right? And so they they relicensed to a license that was more minimal to Redis themselves, so they could make some money. Um, but then everybody forked off, right, and did their own exactly. Thing. Now there's a well, there's it, a Redis fork. They they took so much hate from that by trying yeah. to protect themselves, and that goes back to the sort of like I've had this in my mind for a couple of weeks now, more so in the last week or so, but this, this idea of community, you know, this open source community and what that means and the expectations that live there where it's like, you know, yes, this free is in beer and free is in speech, you know, but would anybody ever actually, excuse pay me, for excuse me. Stallman would say Libra. Uh, <laughs> I speak English, so I'm going to say free. Uh, Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I mean, this, this concept that people just aren't going to pay for things, right? I mean, you can spread that across to traditional media, to streaming services and, and, you know, intellectual property. You can say that about software. I mean, hardware, because they're literally not going to walk into a store and steal it, they might have to pay for it, right? But the idea I that software it. is so portable, <laughs> yeah, try that in an Apple store and see if you make it three no, steps out the door no, not doing it those are all those all have gps man they would find me so fast that's right oh. we got their air tags in there that's right that's why you got i keep you seeing more and more interesting stuff. i keep seeing more and more interesting things that people do with the air tags like things that i would have never thought to track or whatever it's it actually is a really smart product what like anyway. your keys dude i i need that like that's my thing like i don't know where yeah. my keys are ever in any case any day whatever I just don't <laughs> like I need one for my wallet too. Like that would be great. Yeah, actually the the money clip I have has a you can put an air tag in yeah. the clip itself. Yeah. That is correct. Uh, anyway, for bit of a like me. sidetrack there. <laughs> but uh but yeah, th this idea that open source it is just perpetually free. There's no cost to it. There's no value to it. And you know, Bill, you say value for value, but that that requires someone to actually see the value in the first place this this level of entitlement this sense of like I, and i'm owed free everything is so pervasive and I, I mean i don't know how you ever get away from that Ads. i wonder if it's just that you make it don't i mean you you laugh but google no, it's has true won. it's true it's true you make it available for free for enough people then eventually you get the people that are willing to pay because they 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 are able to pay not everybody is not everybody is willing but if it's available to more people like fishing in a barrel you're going to eventually get the kind of people that it's about one percent yeah it's about i mean it's yeah that's pretty low it's funny you say that uh because when i i actually never really understood this about mobile games how where they build them for whales. a very small subset? Yeah, they they focus on these whales. These That's people right. are willing to spend thousands of dollars. When you go on into one app. of those games and you look at the price of some of these uh, like combo deals or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's like a hundred and nineteen ninety nine, and you're like, who would buy it? three people? But they right. buy it so many times, so often yeah. that yep. it makes sense to just make those. And, if you you, know, you release sure. that for free to a million people, well, the game, yeah, you release for free, and then yeah, the you game. put the, the whale bait up there, and they'll buy it <laughs> whale bait over element. and over and that's over a good way to put it. Yeah. Over and over, and I don't know if it's one percent, but it's a large contingent of people that those are the people that the game, it, like those people, are funding the game. Everybody else, like you and your ninety nine cent, grab it on sale. This is how I do it. Like, you, you know, 99 cents or whatever, and it's normally the $5 pack. Like, yeah, dude, like I've, I've played, uh, I play this Dragon Ball Z game. And I probably put maybe 5 to $10 a year into it when things go on sale or whatever. And it's just advantageous for me or, I, you know, the, the value is right for me to, to purchase part of the in-game stuff. Like, that's the only time I ever do it. 
You ever given money to a mobile game, Eric? Um, a couple times. I, I not not to um, to get like coins or like pay to play stuff, but just to remove ads because it was a puzzle yeah. game that I liked mm. playing. It's that like jeweled, thing. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, basically games like that. Now, okay, so that I do like, and I will if I find any kind of piece of software on the Android platform if they offer a pro version. And that's interesting. Sometimes the only thing you get with pro version is just no ads. I yeah. will throw them because we're never talking a lot about a lot of money. You oh, know, four ninety nine. Yeah, Woo. at most. I mean, like a right. five ninety nine is actually on the high end with some of this stuff. Yeah, uh, I got one. I pay eighteen ninety nine a month for. Woof. Uh, that's that's Trucker Path. It it does quite a bit. You truck for a living, and I then do. you come home yeah. and truck some more. Yep. Don't you wow, know? Wow, it's like me and computers. I I do I, I teach computers for a living, and then I come home and tinker with more computers. Right. Like, but there's I guess there's I a lot guess. of tools that are kind of that are really useful to use uh, while I'm on the road. Trucker Path has got oh no this Trucker makes your Path job knows easier, knows where the yeah. speed traps are. Oh, at. never mind. That's a they different know, category of they app. know uh, because people are connected to it and they're updating information in real time. Oh, it's like Waze. Kind of, yeah, except uh, it's all okay. yeah. totally, truck totally. drivers. Uh, all right, parking availability. Wait, 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 hold on. So this is like this is like the next iteration of CB radios, right? Like yeah. you're not Breaker Breaker 1.9ing anymore. You're just yeah. updating an yeah. app. Yeah, it, yep. it unfortunately, <laughs> it's instead or of the radio, we've got a if you're a guy layer like me. of abstraction. Oh, listen, if it's eighteen ninety nine a month, it's worth every single penny. They could charge forty. Uh, it also comes with GPS uh, yeah. routing and everything. I've got, I've got. Yeah. Uh, uh, what do they call it? navigation built into it? Except okay. it's it's big truck navigation, so it knows the low bridges and the the oh, weight neat. restricted roads yeah, and things yeah, yeah, like yeah. that. So cool. I mean, that's a very valuable piece of software, and yeah. and it's helped me out a lot. So and it, it tells me, me of when I was uh, learning to fly as a private pilot, I was subscribed to several different like you know pilot tracking you know and all, all the sort of mm. mapping and you know hey that might go away pretty soon and, and people keep tracking elon and taylor swift and well rich people don't like that so that's a different thing i mean that's an open <laughs> yeah but this, just the software itself that you have that's the first ipad i ever got was because i wanted to have an, a moving cockpit with me in the plane oh so okay could, right that makes sense the better hardware for the better app i get it yep yep Anyway, so, I, that's, so when you're sitting there describing that's all I could think of. And, and there's so many specialized apps like that out there that are for like a, like an, you'd never hear of it otherwise. But, you know, obviously to probably every trucker is like, oh, yeah, I have that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and a, a lot of them do. And, I mean, it's multinational, too. Because um, we have, a, we have a, a large number of, uh, uh, I don't want to use the word foreign, but they're they're refugees that live in Canada, and a lot of since nine eleven, a lot more Canadian companies come down into the United States instead of the other way around. Prior to that, it was American trucks going into Canada, but now that requires uh, a passport and all that kind of stuff. Well, Canada, it's the same for Canada, but who is the largest pool of people you can draw from who already have passports? that are uh, living in your country that need jobs that might already be trained to drive trucks and that's the yeah, refugees that yeah. and so we have a large number of them coming down into the united states and it's really popular with with them too because it, it it's translated in their language you know the punjabi or hindi or oh okay and that yeah. and so they're able I can to see that navigate being really beneficial yeah yes they, they're able to because it also it's everything from fuel prices to available parking to, you know, law enforcement. It lets you know when a road is closed because of an accident, all that kind of stuff, you know. Yeah, and because Very of the valuable. crowdsourced nature to it, it's all yes. sort of up to date. And, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I've always liked it. But, yeah, giving giving money for software that you get some value out of like that. Because, well, there's Google right in the middle because Google's what makes it so simple if you want the pro version it's you know click a couple buttons and and you pay them you know right there from your google account uh if you're using Android. oh speaking of which so they got me with their uh, cut yeah oh they've yeah got me with with google one now because of our oh I got have, you 
Well, because I have all my photos on there. My wife has all of her photos. My daughter's starting to put hers. And like now all of a sudden our, uh, we've used, you know, 99% of and our And people say. We upgraded to the first level. What? Yeah. And people say that uh, Google's going to, or, or Google's not a walled garden. Well, you've, you've just opted into it, sir. Why do people say that? No, no, they, they well, oh, oh, sorry, that Apple's a walled garden, but this is the same, oh. this is the same kind of thing that Here's the difference. Yourself I don't have we can install service, all that though. same software on our device and your device. We cannot install all that Apple software on what? our device. I can device. install the Apple little sync. I cannot get Apple Podcasts on, on an Windows. Android device. Oh, that's actually Arguably changing. a fantastic piece of software. That's actually changing. So, yeah. you know, hang tight. That, I, I, I will, when that happens, I will, I don't know what I'll say, but I'll say you something. You know, and, and honestly, I know I just said I'm, I'm like looking forward to a post-Google world. I think it's, it's less about Google services and more about just Google's dominance, and especially in things like policy and politics. Uh, I, the service itself I choose to use because it works well with the phone. Also, yes, I could do a next cloud and do my own photo hosting and all that stuff. That's but fitting. I already have my wife, you know, every time something happens with any of our technology, she's like, if anything ever happens to you, I'm just basically going to just have to turn everything off and start from scratch <laughs> because I'm yeah. not going to understand anything you have set up. You know, I'm going to need you guys to come to my house. If something happens to me, yeah, I'll right. wipe your hard because drives, Bill. <laughs> don't worry. Yeah. Because, because yeah, you want to talk about it. convoluted. I know yeah. what he means. I got big magnets. <laughs> yeah. Oh, everything on here is is either next cloud I mean, or incriminating. Between, I mean, you think about the, the, what prompted that for me was there was some video I watched where it was like a short or something where they said, you know, this a is Google your life short. With, uh, YouTube, yeah, yes, yeah. Google Short, uh -huh. YouTube, whatever. Okay. Um, so, thank you for distracting me yet again. Sorry, I'm sorry. My mind is old. You can't do that to me. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. No. So basically, the gist was it was like one of those like comparison of like your life with an IT person, your life, and this is for like a non-technical yeah. person, and your life with an IT person. It's like, you know, IT person has like home automation and servers and like all of this stuff everywhere, and then the non-IT person, you know, it's just whatever came from their ISP and whatever, you know, yeah. whatever junk you know is in their Enjoying house. Enjoying the same they, quality of life. Well, it's, so it's a quality of life thing in terms of like what what you get to do with technology, but then it's also the flip side of if something happens and that person isn't around. Like she said to me many times, like, okay, all the things you do for your web customers, like, do they know like where things are hosted and how any of that works? I'm like, no, that's why they pay me. She's like, okay, so they're going to come to me and say, well, how do I get to my website? And I'm going to tell them what? And I'm going to be like, Tell them to hire someone to figure it out. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, honestly, with, with something like that, right, I imagine you have, like, a document stored I do. somewhere I safely. Do. I do. That is, like, the contingency, right? Like, right. here's your stuff. I'm dead. So, But she still, <laughs> you know? but she still has that, that, you know, that sort of angst around not only that, like, from a, you know, a liability standpoint, but from True. just a day-to-day. -day. Oh, the, uh, we have, we've been using a uh, voice over IP there's this product called an OB, OB High, which is just this little box that is allows you to host like a, a voice over IP system and then have a landline in your house. Hmm. We've been using it for over 10 years, and now the company that's, that sold the hardware is going out of business. Oh. And so they basically are saying, well, you know, it'll keep working, but if you ever need to make a change to anything, like the control panel part of it is probably not going to work anymore because the certificate's going to expire and blah, blah, blah. Open source and it. And so, well, Yeah, but I don't then know. you would need the customer to do something, and that's, that's already that's yeah. a bridge too far. Yeah, and so really the company that I – so it's two, It's the, the hardware manufacturer, the Obihi, and then there's the Anvio, which is the, the voice over IP provider. Anvio is the one – that came to us and said, oh, we see that you're using an OBI, like, that's not going to work anymore after October. So, you know, here's your contingency for, you know, continuing to use that device for the time being, and then you're going to have to transition to something else. And it's the same thing with my Synology NAS, which I've had for 10 years, has been worth every single penny I paid for it, and then some, but they're not going to support that model anymore with updates after this fall. Right. And so it's like, hmm, now what do I do? And you're right, Bill. Will there be some sort of an open source project that maybe 
I can host on there instead of the Synology system. I, don't I know. bet you there's a custom version of Debian that goes right on that thing. And while it I won't to... be the Synology front end, you'll be yeah. you'll still be able to utilize every, I wonder if you every could bit just of the hardware throw in there. Open Media Vault on there or something right. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It'd the only thing fiddly, I really but... I'm, wor I'm worried about is that uh, I chose to use the Synology. Uh, uh, Oh, mirroring, their raid, raid kind of their raid, their raid stuff. Yeah. yeah, their raid stuff. So I'm wondering if 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 I use a Debian, if I use something yeah, else, you won't get that. Well, if it's going to be well, like, well, what do I do with the data that's there? I guess I'm going to do some sort of transition. I don't yeah, know. you get you get a big, massive, like weirdly sized 14 terabyte thing, and then you dump <laughs> all your stuff on it, and then you right. recreate it. You recreate a situation on your NAS, and then put it all back. Leo, but, that sounds like a lot of work to me. Mm. <laughs> oh, it is, but we're IT guys, so we're just that's our that's our lot in life. Uh, <laughs> I, so how do they work? It's like I know it's got something to do with ButterFS, but it's not like completely ButterFS. They don't yeah, use it's something ButterFS like that. RAID. I'd have to really look into it because honestly, I've I've only ever had to replace one drive in there. The the, the four, uh, they're WD Reds, and the four that were Man. in there lasted. The uh, one of them finally died after like eight years, and I couldn't even get that size anymore. That's how old they were. <laughs> so I had to just get the next, you know, lowest size, whatever, next largest size, I guess. And it worked. I mean, it worked perfectly. It, it rebuilt the raid, and like everything was fine. But you know, to just either break the raid and or, you know get the data off, break the raid, rebuild it, reinstall, and then re you know bring everything back over, restore it all. I don't know. I mean, I guess that's what I'm going to have to do. Yeah, but you don't have a choice, really, unless well, you get another Synology is, NAS. That's my choice, right? And that could be, and that could be it, frankly, because for the for the five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars I spent on that thing, honestly, if I if I amortize that and th think about the amount of time and energy and effort it has saved me by having all of the things built in for me, and they've Synology in terms of like keeping up to date with security patches and stuff like that. They've done a very good job, you know, in terms of being a good steward of their hardware. I mean, 10 years, that's a pretty that's a reasonable lifetime. amount of time. Yeah, that's a that's lifetime a in technology. Yeah. For them to have supported it as long as they have. Like, I, it, sure, I could be, I can complain and say, well, this is what you get for, you know, using a commercial product. And, but, I mean, 10 years is a long, I mean, even if I was doing something for myself, like, would I still have the same server running after 10 years? I mean, right. maybe, but... God, Maybe not. So. so just just to be awesome, uh, replace the word Synology with Apple, and you have the same argument. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> oh, I killed Bill. Jeez, <laughs> Bill just like rolled out of his chair. Yeah, oh. he, was, he was like, "Damn it! Now I have to buy an Apple device." Does Apple even make anything like that? What are you talking about? Their laptops will go ten years if you don't. Uh, them. No, no, he. Okay. Oh, you're just mad that it's true. Uh, I'm I'm sure. <laughs> He's I mad that five sure. years later you still have to pay top dollar for a used laptop. Right until all of a sudden because you go to update I'm the sorry. operating system and they say sorry. This they this do model, but it does it does really it it, it makes an argument for the so everything by being soldered on or at least not having an expansion the ability to expand. You know, yeah. when it was soldered on and you got you know let's say eight gigs on board. And then still had an open slot that was forward compatible, right? To me, yeah. like that still made sense. Yeah. Uh, now, where it's literally there's nothing you can do, I think that really does like limit how long that piece of technology be stays viable because it's not like the demands for more and more memory aren't like a constantly escalating process. You know, you can't just keep using the same machine indefinitely and not, it's like trying to use the same phone with, you know, two gigs of, of RAM and 32 gigs of storage, you know, at some point, it's just you, not enough anymore. You say that you can't keep using the same hardware indefinitely. Eric, look at your I customers. Do. You know in your heart, yeah, they will. <laughs> they will forever they will. until the thing bursts into flames. They didn't want to buy yeah. that thing, let alone exactly, the thing they've right? got to like, yeah, replace it with. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Damn so. you and your rational arguments. Oh, man. <laughs> Damn the logic. Yeah. That's right. Knew it in your heart. How dare you? How dare you? <laughs> well, all right. We better get out of here then. I guess we got other stuff to do. 
Uh, let us know what you think, folks. Hit us up on, uh, I don't know, where are we at? We're on Mastodon. Somewhere. Yeah, we got a Mastodon. Because are we on Instagram yet? We're hip like that. <laughs> oh, God, Instagram. You put reels out there, Bill? <laughs> Come <laughs> on. My Facebook <laughs> yeah. page all set up. Yeah. Yeah, go, uh, you can comment on the website, directly on the website. That's a thing. Um, anyway, we'll be back in two weeks. Until then, I've been Bill. I've been Eric. I'm still Leo. See you later, folks. <laughs>